As Alex just read, it's costly to be a disciple. Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We're going to take up where I left off the last time. That is a wrong lesson. Well, we were talking about liberalism, talking about universalism, talking about tolerance, and the fact that all those are the work of Satan to deceive mankind, to keep him from going to his eternity in heaven. Satan is deceiving man with all that he can do to deceive man to believing a lie. So we will enter into the eternal fire of the eternal hell. Our God, our God is long-suffering to the people that are walking on this earth. He's long-suffering, bearing with a lot of people, but our God is not tolerant. Amen. Our God says this is the standard, and people that don't live to that standard don't get to live with God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. We're going to again talk today about things that you know. We're going to reemphasize our belief, the things we know wherein we stand. Satan is deceiving people to believing. Thank you. Satan is deceiving people to believing in a lie. He's even done a great work within the body of Christ in deceiving people to think people outside of Christ might have hope. Brethren, our Lord Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. That means anybody outside of Christ is outside of the possibility of going and living with God eternally. The Lord Jesus that said that, he is the Lord of all lords. Did you just listen to the song that Paul led us in? He is Lord of all. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed King of kings, Lord of all lords. He is the ruler of all rulers. He is the judge of all judges, and what he said will stand eternally as truth and the standard. Either Jesus is God Almighty that came in the flesh, or he's the biggest imposter and deceiver that ever walked on the face of the earth. You can't have it two ways because Jesus' claim says he is God. And what he says is the basis and the standard of all judgment that will take place. He that receives not me, nor the words that I spoke has won the judge him in the last day. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I spake not of myself. But the Father that sent me gave me a commandment, what I should speak and what I should say. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. If we don't believe Jesus, then we believe Satan. There's only two places to be. We're either going to be a believer of Jesus and walk in his steps, or we're going to be a believer of Satan, and he will bring us to an eternity of that fiery hell. We're talking about serious things, terribly serious things. We're not talking about somebody that has a headache. We're not talking about some aches and pains. We're not even talking about things that kill us physically because we're all going to die physically. Whether it's cancer or stroke or, or a road chunk, or a, a, a wreck or whatever it is. We're all going to die. That's no big thing. 
But Satan and our God and our Lord Jesus Christ is in a war of all wars for people's souls. Listen to Jesus. I'm not telling you what I think. What I think is of no value. I'm telling you what Jesus said. What God said. And Jesus not only said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He said, if any man abide in my words, then is he truly my disciples? He will know the truth, and the truth will make him free. Paul said, Galatians 4, 16, Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Did Jesus become our enemy because he told us the truth? Everything Jesus said, he said because he loves us so much that he died for us. We just got through remembering his, his death. He did that for us. He loves us that much. So everything he said is because he loves us enough to die for us. Because our Lord Jesus is the creator. He fulfilled the whole law for us. And he is doing all that he can. He's already done all that he can. And he's the high priest today and continues to do all he can to not only save us, but to keep us saved. Everything he says is truth. He's not our enemy because he tells us the truth. He is our lover because he tells us the truth. He said he is the only way. There is no other way. Universalism is Satan's deceit that would think that people outside of Christ can be saved. There is no salvation outside of Christ. There is none. We'll walk with Jesus, but we'll never see God. We will walk in obedient faith and come to him. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Again, let me emphasize, I'm not going to tell you anything that you should have known for years. But as Peter said, I shall always be ready to bring to your remembrance the things that you know because you're established in the truth which is in you. He tells us in the book of Hebrews, we ought to give the more diligence to the things that we heard lest happily we drift away from them. For if the things spoken through angels, the Mosaic law, Prove steadfast, and every disobedience and transgression received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation that was presented to us first from the Lord and to them that heard it? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. He is the Lord of every part of my being. He's Lord of my thoughts. He's Lord of all my words. He's the Lord of all the way I dress. He's Lord of the way I have a relationship with other people. He's, re he's re Lord of everything. When we come to him, we give him everything. So he says here, Jesus says, being the way, the truth, and the life. Being the truth. He says to these Jews that had come gathered around him, you're going to die in your sins, for except you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. That's not a skin-deep belief. He says you believe that I am the I am. The I am that says I am who I am. I am the I am. That's Jesus. He's the creator. He's everything. And he says, except you believe that, you're going to die in your sins. 
That leaves out all political correctness. That leaves out all liberalism. That leaves out all tolerance. That leaves out all universalism. Jesus says, this is it. This is it. This is the only thing. We're going to stand right here. I don't remember what language it was. I think it was one that came out of New Guinea. One time when I heard Richard Rogers talking to somebody that I, if I remember right, was from New Guinea. And they said that the word belief in their language meant to put your full weight down right here. Belief is where we put our full weight down. It's right here. It's in Jesus our Lord. We put our whole weight down right there. And when we come to Jesus and realize all that he is and all that he says and all of his love towards us and all his desire to bring us back to God in a right relationship, it changes our whole mind and that's repentance. Jesus said in Luke 13, verse 3 and verse 5, except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. It takes a complete changing of the mind. A changing of the mind to think like God thinks. To quit thinking like Satan would like to bring us out to think about. In uh, Ephesians 4, he says that we put away as concerning, concerning the old manner that waxes lust after the lust of the flesh. That we be transformed in the renewing of our spirit. That we put on the new man. That after God is being created in righteousness and holiness and of truth. Righteousness, holiness of truth. Jesus is everything to us. He'll tell you in 1 Corinthians 1.30... Of him then are we in Christ Jesus, who is made unto us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Everything is in Christ. I've said every time I get up here, there's nothing outside of Christ that's worth talking about. Nothing outside of Christ is worth talking about. We get tied up in all the things that Satan thinks makes us think is important. Brethren, there's nothing important but being in Jesus Christ. He is everything. He changes our mind. And if we don't change our mind to think like Jesus and think like our Lord who died for us, he says you'll likewise perish. Believe in Jesus, all that I said about Jesus. He is Lord. Repent and think like he does. And that brings us to where Peter was when he stands before Jesus in Matthew 16. When Jesus says, who do man say that I am? And they said, some say it's John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. He says, who do you say that I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. This human man standing in front of Peter, Peter says he is Christ. He is that anointed one that is Lord of everything. And that confession, if we meet that confession, will change our whole life to like day and night is different. Because now we're going to have Jesus as Lord. As I said a while ago, if Jesus is Lord, that means he's Lord of everything. He says, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Luke 6, 46. He is Lord. That means he controls everything in our life. From our thoughts, he tells you in 2 Corinthians, where 10 about verse 4, 
through five, bringing every thought into captivity and obedience to Christ. Every thought, every word, if you speak, speak in the oracles of God. Every action, be not fashioned according to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. That's over in Romans 12, 2. Jesus is Lord. And that confession will change everything. From that point on, everything in our life is according to what our Lord wants us to do. I heard a man say one time, when we say Jesus is Lord, we're through talking. Because from that time on, it's just Jesus that talks. He's Lord. And we are his slaves. We're his servants. And that confession that Jesus is Lord brings us to what he wants us to do, brings us to the mind of Christ. Jesus tells us that obedience is necessary. He says in, in uh, Mark 16, just before he sends into heaven, in verse 16, he says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieves will be condemned. Jesus says, obedience is necessary. Obedience of our faith is absolutely necessary for salvation. He said, it tells us in Romans, uh, no, Hebrews, Hebrews 5 verse 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience through the things which he suffered and having been made perfect. He become unto all us who obey him the author of eternal salvation. If anybody wants any eternal salvation, it is because they obey our Lord Jesus. There's no other way around it. And how do we obey him? Uh, 2 Thessalonians 1. Starting in about verse 6, he says, If it's a righteous thing with God to recompense affliction to those that afflict you, he's talking about the persecuted brethren in Thessalonica. And to you that are afflicted, rest with us at the revelation of Jesus Christ from heaven, with the angels of his power and flaming fire, rendering vengeance to those that know not God, and those that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall suffer destruction. Even eternal punishment from the face of his might and the glory of his Lord. When he comes to be glorified in the saints. And to be marveled at in all them that believed. Those angels are going to come with flaming fire. They're going to render God's wrath to all those that don't know God and to everybody that doesn't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, Jesus didn't say these things because he was mad at us. He said these things because he loves us. And he wants us to know the way to return to God. So that we can live eternally with God. That's the Lord's desire. That's God's desire. From the time mankind fell in the garden. God has worked everything through history to bring mankind back to a right relationship with him. And Jesus came and brought that privilege to us. But we have to accept that in the manner that God says to accept it. And there's no alternative. He doesn't have a plan B. There's one plan. He said they're going to render vengeance to everybody 
that doesn't know God. That's a lot of this world. And there's a whole lot more that's not obedient to the gospel. They're going to suffer punishment, even eternal destruction. Obedience to the gospel is necessary for salvation. Our Lord Jesus said it. The gospel, the good news, is what we have to obey. And God and the Lord Jesus through Paul tells us what that gospel is that we must obey. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, I make known unto you the gospel which I preached. He preached the gospel which you received, wherein you stand, by which you were saved. And I delivered unto you, first of all, I give to you, first of all, the most important thing. First of all, that which I received, that Jesus died for us, as is written in the scripture, was buried and was raised on the third day according to the scripture. That's good news. That's what we just celebrated, what Judd led us in a while ago, the celebration of Jesus' death for us. That's good news. We don't have to die. Jesus did it for us. He died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised from the dead to live eternally. That's the gospel. And he says, that's what we have to be obedient to, that gospel. He tells you in Romans 6, verse 17 and 18, he says, Thanks be to God that whereas you were servants of sin, you become obedient. Listen to him. You became obedient from the heart to that form of doctrine wherein you were delivered. And having been made free from sin, you become servants of righteousness. There's only two people in this world. Servants of sin and servants of righteousness. There's no place between them. We become servants of righteousness from servants of sin when, he's, when, when we do what? When we're obedient from the heart to that form of doctrine, that form of teaching that delivers us. That form of teaching has to be identical to the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Because that's the gospel we have to obey. We obey it from the heart when we obey a form of teaching. That form of teaching, I didn't keep it very well, did I? That form of teaching Paul had just talked about. Listen to us read again the things that we know, but we take so often we hear it until it's just... We just pass over it. Listen to what that form of teaching is that delivers us. In the same chapter, chapter 6, verse 2, he says, you who died to sin, how can you any longer live therein? Are you ignorant? Yeah, we're ignorant. Are you ignorant that as many as were baptized into Christ... We're baptized into his death. We were buried therefore with him through baptism unto death that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. So also we should walk a newness of life. Four, if we were united with him in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Christ, that the body of sin should be done away, to be no longer in bondage to sin. For he that has died is justified. And if we died with Christ, we believe we shall live with Christ. Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death no more hath dominion over him. 
For the death that he died, he died unto sin once, and the life that he lives unto God. Even so, just like that, reckon yourselves as dead unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ. Notice every verse from 2 to 8 says you're dead. He that's dead to sin, that's a changing of the mind, totally change of mind. You're baptized into his death. You're buried with him in baptism unto death. We're united with him in the likeness of his death. If we died, we're justified. If we die with him, we believe we'll live with him. Coming to Jesus. Coming to Jesus, we die and get rid of our old man and we come to him. And we confess him. He is our Lord. And then we, we bury this old dead man. And the man that comes up from that grave, that watery grave, is a new man. And he lives a life filled with the Holy Spirit and he lives a life in confession to Jesus. Confession isn't just what we do with the mouth. It's a whole life before everybody that says when they see us, Jesus lives in this man. Jesus says in Matthew 10, verse 32, everyone that confesses me before men I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. He that denieth me before men, him will I deny before my Father who is in heaven. My thing timed off. That's coming to Jesus. That is a necessity of coming to Jesus. We've ended up by being buried. We're talking about baptism. Now, baptism is not any more important than faith is. Because you can be baptized all you want to be if you don't believe that Jesus is the I am. Jesus says you'll die in your sins. You can be baptized again and again, except if you don't repent, Jesus says you'll perish. And if you don't confess him before men, he won't confess you before the Father. But the point of baptism is the point where salvation takes place. Before salvation, there can, before baptism, there can be no washing away of sins. And all the scriptures tell us clearly the purpose of baptism. So as we look at this baptism... What does it do for us? He tells you in Acts 2.38, which we all know well, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, unto the remission of sins. Where'd it go to? It's unto the remission of sins. I don't have that written on my thing. It is to wash away sins. He tells Ananias comes to Paul. Chapter 22, 16 of Acts says, Why tarriest thou rise and be baptized, washing away your sins? It is, if your sins aren't washed away, if you haven't come into the remission of sins, you're a sinner and sinners can't go to heaven. There's only one way that the Bible knows to get rid of them. And that is to be baptized unto the remission of sins. Baptism puts us into Christ. There's no salvation out of Christ. That's what we've been talking about since we started. No salvation out of Christ. We're baptized into Christ. Romans 4, 3. Galatians 3, 27. We're baptized into Christ. There's... The newness of life comes after baptism. Chapter 6, Romans 6, verse 4. 
Like as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so also are we raised to walk a new life. The new life comes after it. We're put into one body, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, by one spirit. We're all baptized into one body. There's only one body. There's only one church. Jesus didn't come to make multitude of churches. It is the thing that puts us into Christ. We put on Christ, Galatians 3, 27. For everyone that's baptized into Christ have put on Christ. When God looks down at us, he sees Jesus. We're hidden in Jesus. Therefore, in God's sight, we're righteous, we're holy. Because of what God did through Jesus on the cross in our behalf, and he gives it all to us when we, by obedient faith, do what he says. Baptism is the circumcision of the flesh, Colossians 2, 11. He says you were circumcised, not with the circumcision made with hands, not just like the Jews were, where they were circumcised of a little bit of a flesh. He says you were circumcision, not with a circumcision made with hands, in the putting off of the body, the whole body of the flesh and the circumcision of Christ, when, having been buried with him in baptism, wherein you were raised together with him through faith and work in God who raised him from the dead. And then he just clearly tells you. In 1 Peter 3, 21, after he's been talking about Noah and his family that were saved during the flood, they weren't saved from water, they were saved by water. That water saved them from all the wickedness that God was destroying in this world. They were saved by water, verse 30, uh, 21. It says, in a true likeness does now save you, even baptism. Baptism is our salvation. There's only one entrance. He says in Ephesians 4, 4, there's one body, one spirit, one hope you're calling when you're called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who's over all, through all, and in all. He says there's one baptism. There's only one entrance into God. Yes. Baptism does what things for us? Baptism is how we enter into Christ. You're baptized, or you ignorant men is baptized into Christ, the same Formula of words is used in Galatians 3.27. For as many as were baptized into Christ. We're bapt and he tells us baptism is a burial. He didn't say it's a sprinkling. The word sprinkle is used in the Bible. Randizo is translated sprinkling. God knew the word sprinkle. And he didn't use it. He used the word poor. The word for poor is used in the New Testament 28 times. It's in God's vocabulary. He knows the word. But he didn't use those words. He said, baptizo, which is an immersion. And we don't even have to go to the dictionary to find out the meaning. Because he tells you it's a burial. We're buried with him in baptism. Romans 4, uh, 6, 4, and Colossians 2, 12. Baptism removes sin. Acts 2, 38. Baptism is unto the remission of sins. Acts 22, 16. It washes away sins. Colossians 2, 11. It cuts off our whole body of flesh. That is where salvation is. There's no salvation outside of it. Don't let anybody fool you, especially Satan. He doesn't want you to believe that. Baptism is the only way to get new life. We're raised from the dead to walk a newness of life. Jesus says that the Christian life is so new that it's just like being born again. He says, except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
It's a total new birth. Just like these children are born, these babies are born into this life and they start growing. Jesus says Christianity is just like that. It takes a new birth. Baptism saves. There is no alternative. If you listen to God, there is no alternative. 2 Peter 3, 9. God is not slack concerning his promises, but he is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. As I started out, I said, God is long-suffering, but he's not tolerant. The time's coming when God's standard will be fully met and he warns us, beware. Colossians 2, 8, he says, take heed. That means there's something dangerous out there. Take heed lest anyone should make spoil of you through his philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, in whom you are made full, who is the head of all principalities and powers. Don't be deceived. Universalism is a lie. Tolerance is a lie. Liberalism is a lie. Political correctness is a lie. Jesus is right. The only right. And he tells you, don't be deceived. Jesus says, not everyone that says unto me, we're in Matthew 7 now. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name? And in thy name cast out demons, and thy name do many mighty works, and I'll profess unto you, to them, I never knew you. Never knew you. What a hideous day that'll be for all these that walk thinking they're serving Christ and don't obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pitiful day. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Enter ye in by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad in the way that leadeth unto destruction, and many there are that enter therein. For narrow is the gate and straightened the way that leadeth unto life, and few there are that find it. Don't be proud of your tolerance. God isn't. Be proud of the fact that Jesus died for you. Be proud of the fact that because of Jesus, we can enter back into a perfect relationship with God our Father. He gives us the right to enter into the Holy of Holies and talk to God our Father. He heals all bad relationships between us and a holy God. And when we come to Jesus and are baptized into him, in God's sight, we're just as holy as Jesus is. He is, in our place, our righteousness, our sanctification, that's holy, and redemption. If you haven't done that, I'm not your enemy because I tell you the truth. Huh? If you haven't done that, you'll never see heaven. You'll never see heaven. Jesus told us that so we would know how to go to heaven. He explained all that so we can have eternal salvation. Paul's going to lead us in a song. If anybody needs that or if we have listened to Satan, those that are in Christ and need to come back, whatever whatever. You need to do. Make it right with God. Let's stand up and let's sing. And if we can, if God can help you in any way, come forward.